More than 125 years ago, railroading was Wilmington's main industry. When the Wilmington and Weldon Railroad was completed in 1840, it was the longest continuous railroad in the world at 161 miles long. It later merged with other railroads to become the Atlantic Coastline Railroad, which was headquartered in Wilmington. Then in 1960, Atlantic Coast moved its headquarters from Wilmington to Jacksonville, Florida. It was the largest move of employees ever staged by an industry in the southeastern United States. More than 1,000 employees, their families and belongings, company files and equipment were removed more than 450 miles by rail. And Wilmington had lost its main industry. In November last year, North Carolina Governor Pat McCrory came to Wilmington to be part of an announcement that the rail industry is returning to our region. Vertex Royal plans to invest more than $20 million to convert the former Terex Cranes facility to make rail cars. The company plans to have 1,300 employees, which would immediately make it one of our region's largest employers with nearly as many employees as PPD. The company expects to have annual revenue of $600 to $800 million by its second year of operation. We're happy to have with us today the founder and CEO of Vertex Rail, Donald Crodo. He will be interviewed on stage by the Business Journal's editor, Vicki Janowski. If you have a question today, please text it in to the phone number that's on the 10 cards at your table. That number is 910-264-8955. Make sure you include your name and table number on the text. We'll get a microphone to as many people as possible so you can ask your question directly. Please uh, join me now in welcoming Donald to the stage and to Wilmington. So by all accounts, Donald Crodo is a self-made businessman. Um, you heard the, the highlights of his career from Gary. Thanks again for stealing my intro. Um, <laughs> but Donald uh, has been very open with the fact that he had a uh, tough beginning and disadvantaged background but then rose and made decisions as a, as a young person to overcome those obstacles. Um, he entered the industry that he provided the beginnings of his career to this point at the age of 19 mm. as a shipper. And we were just talking about the, uh, the way you got there was deciding right. <laughs> in middle school to take French over right. woodworking, which yeah. got you your first job. Right, it's, it's amazing when I tell young kids today, and, and many of you now when you studied Spanish or Latin or whatever in school, you said, I'll never use this language. The truth is I studied French for five years as a junior high kid and a young high school kid and thought I'd never use the language ever. It was a waste of my time and why did I do it? But I had a choice of either taking wood shop at the time or French, so I took French and, uh, because my last name was French. And um, when I was 19 years old, I was working for a grocery store chain and I didn't like the job. I was mad at the world. I had a lot of issues at the time that I was working through and I applied for a job out of the newspaper for a company called Alcatel. Now, some of you may know it's a very large French company. I actually thought it was someone's name, Alcatel. I had no <laughs> idea who these people were. So I went and applied for the job, and they gave me a, a letter, a letter written in French because they're a French company, and they said, can you read this? And thank goodness for all those years of French that I not, never thought I'd use. I could read about 60% of the letter, and they hired me. And that started me down the road because they did in a very small scale, a very sophisticated way, the type of fabrication that we do today. So it's because of that decision when I was 11 or 12 years old to either go to woodshop or French that we're probably all sitting here today. So. <laughs> and so from there, you went on to several different companies and then um, also took over Vertex FD, where you make large scale pressure vessels and large right. fabrication. Um, and in a roundabout way, which brought you here to Wilmington and mm -hmm. the railroad industry. Yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit first um, what's going on with the facility <clears throat> right now. How's it going and what else needs to happen in order for production to actually start? Well, we need to continue with the upfit of the facility. I, I, I appreciate the fact that most of us here today would like to talk to me about buying something or selling something and I respect that. I'm a businessman and a business person and you guys are too and uh, we really are the engine that makes everything go in Wilmington and in the country and uh, thank you for all your help. And I'd like to say to Sean and Gary, um, you stole my thunder as well because both of you said things that are very important that it isn't only about money, it's not only about doing work and being good, it's also about doing good. And I think both of you guys said exactly what I would say, which is we have to give back, we have to do more, and we have to progress. So back to the facility. Um, we, we're continuing the upfit now. We have to buy some equipment. We have to include rail infrastructure. 
We have to uh, do some work in the parking lots. We have to hire our facility team one, which is our, for lack of a better word, a strike force, which will come in, a group of maybe 40 to 50, 50 to 60 people, which will come in as our highest level of employee, our most skilled professional or worker, and uh, help us build the first two sample cars and become certified as a manufacturing facility. One of the things that probably isn't well known or at least appreciated about the rail industry today because of the sensational news articles out there. It is inherently an extremely safe industry and they're very careful about who they let in to do this work and they're very careful about who does the work and who controls the work. So you go through a multi-step process of a, of, a, of a model approval, an FEA approval, a design approval, and then a facility approval before you can build a car. So we have to build two sample cars in the Wilmington facility somewhere between now and the end of, let's say, April or early May. Those cars, they'll come in and look at our manufacturing process, look at the quality of the cars we built, those first two cars. And if all goes well to my, my folks over in the table there, who do all the work, by the way, um, we will become certified. And from that moment on, then the hiring ramp up begins and we start building cars. We actually have orders for cars, and we have to start delivering them in August and July anyway. So this timing at this point in time, where before it was a little bit fluid, and we're working towards a, a final startup, we actually have to get started now, and we will get started, and they're doing that now. So. Okay. And we're going to talk a little bit more about what Vertex does and what the industry conditions are like sure. um, so that we can understand a little bit more about where it's going to fit in the community. Mm -hmm. um, but first, let's talk a little bit about yourself and your background. Sure. <clears throat> You've been very candid um, about... The, um, about growing up poor, growing up um, mm -hmm. in the projects in a single parent household. And I'm kind of curious about what um, those experiences did to propel you into business and what lessons they still carry with you as you do business. Well, that's true. I, m my dad left when, when we were, uh, I was five, my sister was three, my brother was six, and uh, frankly never looked back, uh, never supported us, never did anything. And we just ended up uh, on welfare, living in the projects. And I would say to Anyone who may say that welfare doesn't matter and we don't need it, I would tell you the opposite is true. Um, I think there has to be a balance of, of too much and too little, uh, but I wouldn't have survived without someone supporting me, without people supporting me. I was a foster kid before there were foster kids. I'd, my mother was, uh, did her best, but she was always quite ill, and there'd be times when I'd walk home from school and there'd be a stranger in the house saying, you're going to come live with me for two or three months. So. To answer your question, what those things do to you is they, they probably put a chip on your shoulder. It's always a fight with me. It's always a battle. It's always a competition. Um, I think it uh, creates a very hungry individual. And I don't think, for me personally, I can tell you that that never stops. Uh, I never think I've made it. I never think I've been successful because I've had plenty of failures in my life. Uh, and I think that pushes me and motivates me to keep doing and working and pushing. Uh, the other thing it does, I think, is provide an emotional foundation, an emotional content that maybe some other folks don't have. I do appreciate where I've come from and how far I've gone. And I do think that by seeing that and coming through that, I think I can help other people and maybe teach some folks here and other places that they can do the same as well. Was that one reason why you started in straight to the workforce into the industry at, what, age 19? Oh, well, yeah. Time? Unfortunately, I never got to go to college. I barely graduated high school, maybe not because I, maybe I'm clever, maybe a little bit smart, but because I just never had the foundation. I never had anyone saying, you could do it, or here's how to do it. Uh, I mean, I can tell you that for years, I, I felt like there was a beehive around my head because I had no idea how to do what I was doing. I just was kind of learning and stumbling and fumbling as I went along. So I didn't get the opportunity to go to college, so I just strapped on really early as a young kid out of high school and started to work. What do you think it was that propelled you to take down that, uh, go down that route as opposed to some others that would have been more detrimental? Was it just something internal? Uh, there were plenty of opportunities to be bad, mm -hmm. and I was bad. <laughs> That's true. Um, I was bad early on, and I, I, uh, I was mad at the world, and I was one of the kids that uh, if you wanted to fight, just knock on my door, and I would, and I don't mean a verbal fight, I mean a fist fight. We would have at it. As many times as I could, I would fight with someone because it was a way for me to get out some of the issues I was dealing with, some of the anger that I had inside me. And um, uh, so I was bad. I was at times. And, uh, but at, at 18 and 19 years old, I, I'm not sure what it was. We had talked before, you and I, and you asked me that question. And I, I don't think I know what it was. I couldn't tell you one thing or one reason. But at 18 and 19 years old, when I went to work for this company, again, which is why we're all sitting here today, a switch flipped in my head. And I said, I'm going to learn how to do this. 
I don't know why, I don't know how come, but I just started to learn how to do this. And, you know, someone said a long time ago, I remember an older person at the time, because I'm older now, said to me, hey, I'm going to tell you to be a success in life and business, you only have to work a half a day. And I said, really? And he said, yeah, you just pick which 12 hours it's going to be. <laughs> so I think in the room we all know that, right? We all know what it's like. And, and I would say that's what happened was that, that at 18 and 19 years old, I just said, for some reason, I'm going to learn. I don't know if it was that they were a, a global presence, that my, my limited French ability could be used, that, that for some reason, some way, I saw maybe a, a future that I had never seen before. And I just decided to learn how to do what they did. And I started working 60 and 70 and 80 hours a week. And like all of us in this room, I don't think I've stopped since. And uh, so I just learned how to do it. And over time, by saying yes to an opportunity, yes to a problem, yes to a situation, I evolved to learn a lot about what they do and how they do it. And that's helped me be where I am today. Now, you've joked um, that you're known around town here as the railroad guy. Yeah, the train guy. The right. train guy. Yeah. And you had experience in um, large scale fabrication, mm -hmm. pressure vessels, large chambers, very large um, design and fabrication. But railroad is actually new to you. It's a new Correct. industry. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how you got into this sure. and why the rail? Well, I think it's a matter of what I just said of saying yes to an opportunity. About almost two years ago now, we were approached by a group of people. We make one of my other companies makes pressure vessels and vacuum chambers, very large. We've done work with GE Nuclear, MIT, NASA, companies all over the world making very large scale, very complex pressure vessels and vacuum chambers and storage tanks. And there's a group of people that approached me to make what I thought was an unimaginable amount of tanks, not tank cars, but physical tanks that they would put on rail cars at that time and drive around and transport the oil. Because the impetus for us to get into the, to the industry, into the business was oil crewed by rail or oil transport by rail um, because they use vessels and tanks, which we were familiar with. So this group approached me, and I, 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 we were at the table talking to Gary and the guys, and, um, and, they, and I was making the joke about the Jetsons and the Flintstones. And we're up in the Northeast, and we're working with NASA and MIT and GE Nuclear and all these things, and our stuff is shiny and big and fancy. So we're the Jetsons, and the trains to us were commuter rail, and we never see a train. It's more of an irritation because it prevents you from going to the mall five minutes faster than you, you would normally. Um, so, so they came to us and said, hey, could you build 40,000 of these tanks for us? Because we're going to put them on flatbed rail cars, and we're going to transport the oil that way. They thought that was a clever idea. Now, that was a, a stunning number, of course. And I said, there's no way the Flintstones need the Jetsons and the Flintstones. There's no way the Flintstones need these many tanks. It's impossible. Well, I studied the industry really quickly for like a week and a half, and I realized they do need those many tanks. <laughs> the Flintstones really did need that many. And I think, I think it, it, the point is that this was a market that was completely unknown to us in the stratosphere. The Jetsons had no idea that this industry, these people, these companies needed these many tank cars or tanks. That group actually disbanded. They couldn't support the opportunity. The industry wouldn't allow because of its regimentation of radius of car track and the refineries were built 50 and 100 years ago and the valves are in a certain place and the pipes are in a certain place that this, what well, was a very clever idea of putting these tanks on flat cars instead of tank cars. Um, just didn't have enough horsepower and the industry wouldn't accept it. They kind of disbanded. And the market research I did made me realize that with a lot of work and a lot of effort, we could get into that market. And so that's how we started down that road, by saying yes to what was a, a rather high mountain to climb. But we said yes, and we're at the top now, I think. Yeah, and this is a very old school industry, too. Sure the it is. Old guard. You think there's only, what, four or five other companies that mm -hmm. make these rail cars in the US? Right. And they've all been around for decades. Yes. Um, and so you guys are, are really are the, the newest players on, on the block for it. Um, what's it like kind of breaking into that industry? Or how did you, it's how did you guys difficult. do it and other companies haven't? I'll be nice and say that the rail industry is an extremely mature industry. <laughs> I think our next newest competitor for tank cars, which is our primary focus, we are, over time will branch on other <clears> things, of course, but um, has been doing it since, I think, the 1940s. And that's the newest kid on the block compared to us. Yeah. Uh, they really didn't care if we were here. It didn't matter to them if we came online. Um, there are such regulatory and, and safety issues and design issues and control issues that it's a really difficult industry to get into. And I think they knew that. I think they didn't think we'd ever get to this point. Other people have tried and kind of fallen by the wayside. Uh, but we are the fifth company in the history of the United States to have a design approved for making tank cars. 
Uh, we only have, it's true, we only have four domestic competitors and one in Canada, and they are book solid for two or three years, which is one of the reasons two years ago we picked this target. If we had picked a different kind of a car, so when you look at marketing as, a, as business people, and you look at where you might go in the future, if we had picked a different car and made the mistake of picking a different car, we wouldn't know until now it was a mistake, but it would have been a deadly mistake. It would have mm. been a fatal mistake. We just happened to pick the right car and type of car, group of cars, for the industry, for the safety issues, for the, the market, and for the future, and, and we were lucky enough to have done that. And, and so we've made it so far. We've made it so far. Uh, and it, but it has been really difficult because they didn't care if we were there. They didn't welcome us at all. In fact, they prefer we just die and go away. Uh, the customers are very interested in us. We've quoted almost 40,000 cars in the last six to nine months, which is a stunning amount of work, right? Um, so the market needs us. The opportunity is in front of us. The industry doesn't care if we're there, but we're pushing through no matter what. Okay. And another interesting thing that we've talked about before is just the, the financing uh, mm -hmm. for getting this plant open. Right. So when we talked a couple of months ago, at that point, you were saying you guys really weren't seeking out equity or outside investment. Mm -hmm. You're kind of relying on the founder's capital, which is a small pool of you guys that have started this up. Um, I'm just curious, is that still the strategy that you guys are using now, and why that, that route? It is so far the strategy, we, the strategy we're using. I think I was pretty transparent at the time we talked. We're always looking at equity people, um, because this is not a... I have been a small business person, and am still today, in my opinion, a small business person. I still fight and survive every minute of every day. I tell people you're not in business until you need to make payroll, and you can't. That's when you figure out how to be in business. Uh, in today's world, in yesterday's world, in tomorrow's world. And as a small business person, we're always fighting, we're always battling for literally make it through Friday, make it through Monday, make it through the next year, the next month. Um, but as founders, we've been able to fund the company on our own so far. We are and have always talked to equity people. This opportunity becomes big enough when you talk about a revenue stream, as Robert said, of six to $800 million a year. It becomes big enough that people want to invest money. Uh, but, it's, but as an entrepreneur, as a business person, lots of us in the room are that way. You have a choice of freedom or money. And you always have to be making that decision constantly, every day, every minute, every second. And uh, we are looking at equity players because they will help us get to that next step. We just haven't pulled the trigger on any of yet. But for the startup costs and retrofitting the facility and the hiring, <coughs> you guys are kind of keeping it in-house? At the moment, yes. Why don't we take a break and uh, see if there's any questions from the audience? Sure. Well, thank you for being here today. The heart and soul of any community is the uh, middle class, the people who have the economic viability to buy our products and services. So what's Vertex's commitment to creating good middle class jobs as just opposed to high wage uh, upper management and then a bunch of uh, minimum, uh, minimum wage line workers? Well, that's actually a good question. I, I, again, I, I've been out in the community for several months now. I've been fairly public with what we're trying to do. Not for me, but for the company and for the community. One of the nice things, and we, Vicky and I talked about it before, and we talked about it at the table as well. This is a life-changing opportunity for my partners and I, for my teammates and I at that table, and for everybody in the community. This does not happen more than once in maybe two lifetimes for people, and we're very lucky to have it, have it in front of us. Uh, of our expected 1,342 jobs, uh, over a thousand of those jobs are regular, everyday shop people. They do have to have or get acquired or be trained to have a skill set in welding, fabrication, moving material, bending, rolling, forming. But our average wage is well publicized is going to be about $40,000 a year. And that goes for all of our people. So I think that when you talk about a thousand everyday regular jobs for everyday regular people, uh, I think that speaks to what we're going to try to do for the middle class and for the community. We also expect that to trickle down, and not trickle, but hopefully flood down to the community in general as well. So I think our job focus and the type of work we're going to do is very different than some of the other folks maybe in the community and around. We do need an, actually, an opposite requirement of everyday jobs, a big requirement for everyday jobs as opposed to a few everyday jobs. And our wages are not cheap on purpose. We didn't come to Wilmington to find low-cost help. That was not our, our job as, as partners, as teammates. Our job was to come here, be successful, and make the community successful as well. Do you know... Um, do you know ballpark? How many people have applied since you guys had oh, a sure. big uh, um, in December? 
we, <laughs> we, we had a, um, we made the announcement in November with the governor um, and all the folks there. We had a job fair, an open house on December 6th, uh, both for selfish reasons, because we wanted to see how many people might apply. Because when we started this process well over a year ago now, um, the first folks we met were Billy King and uh, Scott Satterfield from Wil Wilmington Business Development. Uh, and they introduced us to, um, to Rob and the folks at Wilmington Business Journal and then as well to keep your community college. Because when you make the decision to come anywhere at, at the size we may, we may become, um, the job creation was a big deal. We're creating the jobs, but we need the people to fill the jobs because it is a risk. It's a gamble. 1,300 jobs, no matter where we decided to go, was going to be a significant impact for us and for the community. And we needed skilled help, or we needed help that was willing to be trained and become skilled. Uh, and they showed us fairly early on that Wilmington might be able to do that. But of course, everyone goes into these things with their fingers crossed and hoping it's going to be true. Uh, but when we had the job fair, the open house in December, we were stunned at the response. We've had over 6,000 applications and resumes uh, for people to be employed at Vertex Rail. We probably have easily filled, even in a basic skill set, concept over half of our welding jobs. We could fill over half of our welding jobs. We have made, a, as you know, a mandate to hire 10% of our workforce from disadvantaged communities to help everyone in the community be successful. And we'll train those people and we'll train anyone else we need to to fill those jobs because selfishly, we need those people to be successful. They'll be successful with us, but we will be successful with them. And I think that's a perfect way to run your business, to be together as a group and be successful together. And then, how is the hiring going? What stage are you guys at now, and what are you looking at? Well, we, we, we have several issues. We have the update issue that we're dealing with. We have the, um, the delay in regulatory release by the government on the tank cars. Um, so to answer your question directly, we've hired probably a handful of people, mostly managers and higher level folks. We are the facility team one will be hired in the next two to three weeks. Uh, that'll be 40 to 60 of the, the best of the best, to use the term. It's not meant on a personal level, but our job is to bring the highest level skill set in first to get the facility certified. By getting certified, then it allows us to open, we'll call it the floodgates, because we'll be hiring another two to 300 people in April and through June, and then another 300 to 400 from June to August. So we'll be at a maybe a seven to 800, eight to 900 run rate by the end of the summer. And if the regu regulations that are going to be released soon do what we think they're going to do, then this pent-up demand of these 40,000 cars we've quoted will begin to release itself and we'll have more business, frankly, than we know what to do with. So good for us. All of us, by the way. You want to take another question? Thank you for being here and taking time out to answer these questions. Uh, I'm with Air Gas National Welders. And of course, we're very much concerned about or wanting to be involved with the welding process. Uh, I was thinking about the training you were talking about for all the welders that you're going to need, and how Cape Fear Community College is going to go about training all of the people that you're going to need. Will it be done at your location, at the school's location? Uh, that's my question, sir. Sure. Well, uh, that's a, just a dry question for the group here because it's definitely focused on he and I. Um, we developed with Cape Fear Community College over a period of several months, by the way, a tremendous group of people. They could not have made, a, made it a better choice for us to come here. They did a great job in private, in quiet, confidentially from November of 2012 to today, or 13 to today, just quietly showing us that Wilmington was a great place to be, and they did a wonderful job. Um, but over, over the last maybe six to eight months, our technical group, and they have looked at our welding procedures, our welder qualifications, the type of material we're going to be welding, the type of weld technique we're going to have, and they developed a complete training program with our people on the weld joint design, the type of metal, the type of bead, the type of things a welder would have to deal with. Uh, and some of the training will be done at their facilities in, in Cape Fear Community College, and some will be done at our site as well. Most will be done off-site because it, very quickly, in a period of three to four months, the, the, the Vertex Fab facility or the rail facility on, on Raleigh will become a working facility. So the training can't take place there because we're going to be busy making things and shooting them out the back door. So um, training will be done there and at our facility initially and then transition exclusively to the campus at, at that point. 
Um, speaking of the, our future and your future, how does the uh, potential for the, key, the Keystone Pipeline approval, how will that impact um, your company and both of our futures? Well, that's a good question. Um, Sarah, thank you. Uh, I'm not against the pipeline. You might think that I consider it as competition and any attack on a business in a, in, that we have is, is competition. But the reality is with a pipeline is that it is a fixed, you think of a pipe in your house or a pipe on the side of the road, it's a fixed diameter, and in reality it goes in one direction, north, south, east, west, um, so that even though, it, even though it may someday get built, uh, and again, I'm not necessarily against it, um, I think the time for it to be approved to be built and then ultimately built is maybe, if it happens, is 10 or 15 years from now. Um, I was in Asia uh, several months ago, and meeting with a group and they asked me about the pipeline, much like Sarah just did. And I said to them, you know when, when your government tells you to do something and you say yes, and they nodded their head and said absolutely. I said, when our government tells us to do something here, we say no. The first thing we do is say no. And when you think of a pipeline having to run through every city, town, state, county, uh, from Canada to wherever, or from east to west, it's a daunting task for any government agency, any group of people to get something like that approved. It may get approved ultimately, and that's fine. But for me, it's a fixed diameter, fixed amount of oil, fixed direction that really doesn't allow anyone using it ultimately flexibility. Um, so while it is competition, it will take some of the capacity away from the rail, crude by rail market. I think that crude by rail and rail oil in general is growing here enough that the pipeline will be one choice, but it's not going to impact what we're doing really at all. So fundamentally, um, why did you guys choose Wilmington out of all the markets and um, available buildings that you saw? Well, um, there were a lot of states that were pushing for us quietly. We had interest in Georgia, South Carolina, uh, Texas, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Colorado, uh, Canada. Canada was interested, California as well. Um, the first criteria was, was there a building was there space that made sense? Making a rail car is not an easy task. The average car is 60 feet long. When it's all outfitted, 10, 12 feet in diameter, 14 feet high, these are not little. So you need facilities that are rather wide and tall and long. Uh, you need facilities that are located close to rail. And when we started doing our initial searches, we saw this facility kind of pop up on the real estate screen. Um, we knew it had potential. We knew it actually fit in a broad sense with what we wanted. I had an experience here in Wilmington doing work with GE Nuclear for years. So I, 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 I joke I knew Wilmington. I knew the Hilton, and I knew the riverfront, and I knew how to dro drive to GE, but that was my, but I knew, I thought I knew Wilmington, and it was really good. I knew that, that from a higher level skill set, quality, engineering, that type of thing, GE showed itself well, and I knew that that there had to be a vibrant community of highly skilled, higher level workers within Wilmington. So we started doing research. As I said, I came down here quietly in November of 2013, I think it was, and um, looked at the site, met with the folks all around, and over, I think I came every month for about four or five months. And with that group of people who quietly represented you all extremely well, I uh, realized that Wilmington did offer beyond the building, and the higher skill set potential to fill our jobs, that there was a good foundation of regular folks and regular jobs and need for those jobs. So that's kind of how fundamentally we, we got to the point where in, uh, I think it was September, October of, of last year, we made the final decision to come here and the announcement was done in November. Okay. Um, does anybody have another question? Did, uh, someone text in a question first informing us that you speak Mandarin Chinese. I do, a little and, bit, uh, yes. Wanting to know one. And a little French, as you now know. <laughs> so how did that happen, and can you please answer in Mandarin? <laughs> <laughs> I can't, but uh, uh, I could, but it wouldn't matter. Um, it all came from studying French, right? I, I, I took French in, in the 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th, and of course no one in the project spoke French, so it was kind of a waste of time. And uh, I was so sick of the language and, and, real, and thought at the time as a young kid, I will never use this ever again. Why am I doing this? And a teacher had come back from China at the time, and they offered a, a Chinese class. And as a senior in high school, I had a choice of either taking more French, which I was sick of, 
I, by, if there are any French teachers out here in this, I, I apologize, but I just had had it up to here with French. And uh, so I, I, uh, I studied Chinese language in my senior year and did well with it. And um, it's actually, I, I don't know if it matters to our conversation today, but ultimately it's a very simple language. Their grammatical structure, their sentence structure, their, their communication structure is very simple. The, the, the words are very difficult, the, the tonal inflections are very difficult, but putting sentences together once you know some words and know more words and more words is actually very easy. So I started in my senior year in high school and I uh, just kept up with it as best I could and um, it's helped me in business and in life as well today. So. And you still travel to China? I do, I was in China there almost every month last year. I was in China in February. Uh, my other businesses do work in China. Uh, there is a potential within the rail industry to do some work in China. Uh, all of my competitors buy some of their components in China. Um, the rail industry is extremely well regulated and very safe, as I said. Uh, even the Chinese suppliers have to be approved by the US government to do the work. Um, so when you're dealing with a Chinese supplier in the rail industry, they are approved by our government to do the work. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a fairly close-held community. They know we're out there, we know they're there. Uh, but my language skills have helped me there as well. So, so you've talked about um, your projections for the next couple of years, and it's mm -hmm. an ambitious plan yes. beyond just the hiring at 1,300 plus. Mm -hmm. um, you've said 600, 800 million uh, yes. annual revenue mm -hmm. in the next two years. Yep. Um, why such the large potential? Like, why is this such a lucrative um, business model? Well, one have? of the reasons for the revenue number is that the cars themselves are expensive. Mm -hmm. The, the least expensive car that may come out of the Wilmington facility is close to $85,000. The most expensive at the moment is in the high 180s to 190. So it doesn't take a lot of cars to hit a revenue stream of six or 800 million. Um, the reason for that is that the rail industry is very mature, very old. There is not a lot of competition. Uh, you have to be qualified and certified to build the type of car that you build. And there just has not been anyone come into that space in 40 or 50 years. We have four domestic competitors. They are all, by their own announcements, booked solid for the next two to three years. So if you need an oil tank car and you haven't already bought one, or you need it in the next two or three years, you're not going to get one. So coming into this space was a calculated decision by us. Bringing this capacity online was an aggressive but calculated decision by us because we knew that the market needed these cars, now, notwithstanding the current price of oil. The market needed these cars. They had to have these cars. And they couldn't get them anywhere. So when we attacked this market, we attacked it on purpose. So when you look at a revenue stream of six or 800 million, it sounds like a stunning number. Um, it is, of course. Personally, I will tell you, it's a, it's a great number, but it's a stunning number. But it's calculated based on a capacity in Wilmington of four to 5,000 cars a year, a price of 140 to $150,000 a car per average. You can see it doesn't take a lot of cars and a lot of capacity to get to that number. And when we've quoted as many cars as we had, we know there's a pent-up demand for people needing these cars. We think we'll hit that number fairly easily and fairly fast. Um, and now you've talked about this before, but um, it's been an interesting discussion because the, the lack of tax incentives, which often go hand in hand with the discussion mm -hmm. of an industrial user coming in. Now, you, so you guys decided not to seek out um, tax credits, tax incentives Here in Wilmington, the state yes. for Wilmington. Right. Can you explain a little bit about what the rationale was with that? Sure. Um, I, I've already listed the other states <clears throat> that approached us, and they were very aggressive in their, in their offerings of, of incentives, tax benefits, credits, what they do. Um, we had made an emotional, uh, because I tend to be an emotional guy, uh, and I can tell my, fan, my financial guy said, well, you're crazy. But I had made the emotional decision. We as a team, I have two of my three partners at the table over there. We made an emotional and, and I think professional decision to come to Wilmington back in the late summer. Um, and I don't know if I'm telling tales out of school to some of my government friends who may, in the audience, but, may be in the audience, but we were talking about incentives. And we got into that. And we wanted to see what might be offered and what, what was available. But I had to lie at that time. I mean, I, I'd be honest, we're sitting here in front of all these people. In order for me to get incentives, I had to say I didn't like Wilmington, that we weren't going to come here, or we might not come here. And we had made a lot of decisions, financial, professional, tactical, strategic, emotional, that Wilmington was coming to front for us. The people here are wonderful. The 
facility was great. The community is tremendous. The future here is, is, is perfect. It really is perfect for us. And I didn't see any benefit to sitting in front of anyone and lying and saying, well, we might not come here. Because two reasons. One, it's not true. And number two, it would, it would delay our attack on the market. And for us, it's not, it's, not a, it's not a financial decision only to come here. It's a market decision to do what we're doing. And the market needs us to be up and running soon. So playing games, negotiating in the background for really, uh, and, and I would say that, that Governor McCrory, the state legislature, the, uh, the county folks, the city, everybody has been wonderful and they did their best and they offered the best package they could. But in the scope of a six or eight hundred million dollar business, the amount of money they could give us just wasn't worth hurting them. It wasn't worth putting them or ourselves through this really meaningless exercise of lying and saying we weren't going to come here or we might not come here when we made the decision for all the right reasons that you're all in Wilmington that this was the place to be. So I made the decision we're going to stop talking about it. We're just going to move forward. We're going to forget. Other people offered much more to us but financially, but Wilmington offered much more to us in total. Mm -hmm. So we made the decision to come here. Um, and one more question, we'll, and then we'll go to another public one. Um, so even without the traditional tax incentives, there still will be some public money invested in it. I think there was $1.5 million just to get the improvements on Raleigh Street, mm. of which the city and county recently approved their end of it, 600000 and also some state money for the rail spur improvement. Mm. So with the public money investment up front, um, what can you say to address, like, is there a risk there of the, the public money that things will pan out for the economic boost you guys are planning? And that we won't do what we say we're going to do? Well, are you going to do what you say you're going to do? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, Is that on the record? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm not afraid of anything. But, uh, but uh, you know, the, the, you made a point. You, you said something that I think has to be said about uh, the government folks here. I see Skip Watkins is here and Commissioner Barfield is here. When we decided to say yes in October, November, and we said this is it and we're coming, they could not have done a better job than what they did. We said yes, they've said yes. So instead of, I, I would say this to any business person in the room and anybody who's going to ask me about it in the future, make a commitment to someone, make a commitment to something, and then get on with it because the other people will do the same. If you play games and you're dancing around and maybe this and maybe that, you're wasting your time, the market's time, opportunity for you, and you're wasting the chance to work with wonderful people who are bent over backwards from the governor to, to the people that, I, I talk about Cassandra, who works at ILM. When I go there on Fridays and Mondays when I'm traveling, she makes my breakfast burrito. And she does such a great job. You just say yes and move forward. And everybody in this community, everyone has done exactly the same thing. And they have offered tremendous incentives that we didn't know about beforehand, but they have stepped forward and done the right thing because I think, I hope we've done the right thing as well. Going back to your sort of your history and uh -huh. being an entrepreneur. Um, what was your deepest and darkest moment as an entrepreneur and business owner? How did you overcome it and, and not fold? I had it this morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think as an author, you know, it's funny, I'm, I'm not sure. I appreciate the fact that people consider me an entrepreneur. And I suppose that, that I am a risk taker. I think it's in my, my DNA. Um, uh, Vicky mentioned my early existence and Gary said it as well. When I was 28 years old, I was uh, uh, the, the, one of the top three people in the company, this French company that expanded in the United States. I was traveling all over the world. I, at the time, I was making a lot of money, off what I thought was a lot of money. Um, and, but I wasn't happy. I, it didn't feel right to me. Um, and I quit. At the height of what people might think was success, I quit. And I started my first business, which was a sales rep group. And I took a second mortgage out on my house for $5,000, thought it was a million at the time. And that funded me. And, and I've been basically an entrepreneur, self-employed since then. And I think there are many moments that are our darkest moments. I think that there are times when you, you doubt yourself. Um, I do it even in this business that we do today. Have we made the right decision? Is it too big? Is it too small? Can we do more? Could we do less? And, um, or should we do less? All these different things. 
I, and I just think you fight through them. I have them all the time about, am I treating my people well? Because I've made a lot of mistakes. I would say that as a slightly older guy now that, that I've come to this, this philosophy, as Vicky knows, and people have heard of be good, but do good. Um, ben David, my friend here, the district attorney, has helped me understand some of what I'm working through and working on. And I think we as people, as drivers, as movers, as shakers, as hard workers, have to be good all the time. I think I said this at the power breakfast a while ago, right? We're tasked every day with being on time, being right, taking care of our people, taking care of each other, taking care of ourselves. What's your five-year plan? Are you going to make payroll on Friday? What's, what are you going to do next month? What are you going to do next week? What's the new product? What's the new design? Is the color right? Did they balance the books? You know, did they clean the bathroom? There are so many things we have to do in our lives, personally and professionally, to be good. And we do it every day, as well as we can. Uh, I think for me, as I've, because, and I tried to be good, but I didn't do it the right way. We all make mistakes. And I think the being good part is, is not easy for us to do, but we do it every day. I think the doing good part is what I've come to realize is extremely important. So for me, the darkest moments come every day. They really do. I make mistakes every moment. I have a table full of people here who save my life every minute of every day. Uh, and they, they, they you know, tied their start to me, and God bless them. I don't know why they did it, but we're moving forward every day. And, uh, and I think you just, you just you have your darkest moments. Um, I have them all the time. I've had plenty of business failures in my life. But for me and for everybody here, I'd say just don't stop. Keep moving forward and try to do good. The other part of this be good, do good that I've come to realize in, in only recent years, honestly, is that we have a chance by being good to do good. Don't miss it. Don't miss it because it's going to come around once or twice in your lifetime. And it might be hiring one person, investing one penny, one dime, one dollar in the community. We have a chance by being good to do good. And I'm going to ask you all, don't miss it because it won't come but once or twice in your life. And this is a chance for us at Vertex Rail to be good, I hope, because we have to run our business like a business, but then do good as well. And that's important for us. That's what we've come to realize. So I hope that helps. Thank you so much. Um, your story is so inspiring. And if anybody has a question, if one person makes a difference, you answered that very well, so thank you. Uh, my family has been in the railroad industry for many years, and. I just wanted to see some of the exciting new developments. I know you said it was a mature industry, but mm. I think there's a lot of exciting things that can still happen. And when I was a little girl, my grandfather was an engineer on the railroad, and just seeing that huge you know, train and me looking way up, it was so impressive. So it's an industry that I really love, and I'd like to hear what's in the future. Well, for us, it's, um, it's first a matter of starting. Right? Everyone's heard we're starting, and we will. And we will be successful, I promise you. We'll maybe sit down a year from now and, well, who we did it, right? But, um, and we're moving forward. Beyond these four or five car designs we have now, uh, we also have two or three other designs that allow us, we hope, in the future to actually double the size of the facility. It is our goal. We have at least made not formal plans, please. When I leave here, don't everybody. Uh, my team over there is just getting ready to kill me. But um, uh, we, have had, we have had to plan our facility, plan our rail level, plan our company so that there is the potential in the future if the market allows it, if the community allows it, and the business allows it to double the size of the Raleigh Street facility and thereby double our employment base and double the number of cars. And we believe the market is there for it, not necessarily for the cars we're building and designing today, but by the couple, two or three new designs and next designs will be coming out within the next year. So there'll be more cars, Connie, more different kinds of cars. Okay, well, thank you very much, Donald. We appreciate you making the trip down here to share a little bit more about the company with us. And uh, we'll keep you to a year from now. We'll be <laughs> We'll be, have a great conference. Thank you all for listening. I am stunned that everybody wants to sit and listen to me. I think it's because of the chicken, actually. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you all very much. So, Donald, we wanted to get you a gift to, uh, to, to recognize the, the return of rail to Wilmington. So we went down to the Railroad Museum and got you a uh, couple things. So a picture of one of the, the trains they used to make. And then the old Atlantic Coast uh, rail line map. 
And uh, they also gave us one of the uh, books of the uh, history to give you, too. Great. Thank so, you very much. You Thank you all very much. So uh, Donald has agreed to stick around for a little bit. We're going to take him down to the Expo Hall because the Expo is now open. Seminars start at 145. Bars open at 430. Thank you.